All right, so Epicurus. Now, if you look, if you were to look up the word, uh, you might see a word called Epicurean, if you're familiar with that. Um, it begins in 422. Epicurean usually means, um, in, in modern American English, someone who is given to pleasure. Usually it's connected to food. So an Epicurean is the type of person who likes to chow down on good food. A, a gourmand, I think, is something that uh, would be the same kind of word. But that's actually not too terribly true. In general, Ep Epicurus says that good equals pleasure. However, we have to put pleasure in quotation marks because if you remember the tripartite soul that we've talked about, right? There are several different types of pleasure. There's one here, there's one here, and there's one here, right? So it's not hedonistic. Now, if you look on 422, um, a couple of inter interesting uh, points to take out before we get to the very central one. The central point in the letter to Menachaeus, which, by the way, is a letter of advice that he's writing to some guy named Menachaeus, is the, hang on, one, well, the, the first full paragraph on 423, where he talks about uh, desires, natural, groundless, all that stuff, that's the main thing I want to talk about. Um, however, if you look at the last sentence of the first paragraph, he says, therefore, one must practice the things which produce happiness. So you have to basically practice happiness, right? This is an odd thing. Since if that is present, we have everything. And if it is absent, we do everything in order to have it. So happiness is the key. This is following on Aristotle, right? We talked about Aristotle. Um, and so we know that happiness to Aristotle was the whole point of human life, etc. But notice what he's saying is you also have to practice it, which means that happiness is learned. It is a learned behavior, um, which I think will be difficult for us as contemporary Americans to understand because we tend to think of happiness Actually, you know, if you really think about it, I think more and more in our society, we think of happiness as a, a consumer good, as a product. I mean, we think of everything these days as a product. Even education, more, more and more, is not about enlightenment and learning and civic virtue, right? It's about, um, I need this thing in order to get this job, and, you know, I am a customer so give me what I want kind of thing like customer service and education and that sort of thing and so we even think of you know wisdom now as as um, a product so I think we tend to think of happiness as a product you buy it if it's not a, something that you buy in terms of uh, an action like a cruise or something it's a pill you buy um, so it's an interesting thing but anyways, he's saying that, you know, it's a learned behavior, okay, which means we have to practice how to be happy. And if we're going to practice how to be happy, we need to learn how to be happy, which means we have to know what happiness is in the first place. Okay. Another thing in the, in the paragraph he talks about, in paragraph two, the gods. This comes up in paragraph two. And he says this, if you skip down to, I don't know, about... Um, almost to the bottom of the left-hand column, there's a, a uh, passage that says, the man who denies the gods of the many is not impious, but rather he who ascribes to the gods the opinions of the many, for the pronouncements of the many about the gods are not basic grasp, but false assumptions. He makes a distinction about the gods between the few and the many. Now, if we go back here, right, appetite and emotion, most people tend to be, according to Epicurus and Aristotle, the ancients in general, more repetitive and emotional than they are rational, which then ultimately means that, for the most part, what people want out of life is stuff, physical stuff, consistent with a consumer capitalist society like ours. 
So that would mean that even the way they understand God is going to be related to appetite and emotion. So the God of the many is a God of stuff or emotional security. So in other words, most people think of the gods as getting them things or providing them with emotional security or revenge or whatever the case may be. The few understand that the gods are immortal and good in themselves. So in other words, a lot of people understand God in terms of getting things and having security, whereas the gods themselves are good in themselves, not because of what they give us. So in other words, if we pray for things, right, what he's saying, what Epicurus is saying is, that's the wrong way to understand the gods. That's the god of the many. So the many will pray to God for stuff or revenge, whatever the case is. Whereas what he's saying is the gods are good in themselves, and their sense of justice is beyond our ability to know, so there's no sense in trying to make the gods give us the things we want. Eventually what does begin to happen is that if we don't get what we want, then we become mad at the gods themselves. Okay, he also talks about death in the next paragraph. And death should not bother us. Now, that's not so easy to, to make happen, right? But his argument basically goes like this. Is that since we don't know what death is, right? None of us have died, so we have no experience of it. But we do know that there's no sense experience after you die because your eyes and ears and stuff are physical. And so when they die and your body rots, you don't have any physical perception of death. Therefore, you don't know if it's good or bad, so there's no sense worrying about it kind of thing. Now, um, so he's setting us up for a, a more pleasant life, really, in, the, in a way, if you see that by not being, by not trying to understand God in the way that we want to understand God, and in not fearing death, we're already setting ourselves up for a lack of disturbance, that is, less anxiety and worry. So then we get a rather large um, section here on page 423, um, where in the second paragraph he says, One must reckon that of all desires, some are natural, some groundless, and of the natural desires, okay, you can read it yourself, but do, do read it as we do this. So he makes like almost this matrix of desires, right? And that's the whole thing because, I mean, being human, part of it is that we've got to negotiate conflicting desires right now, right, throughout life. Like right now, for instance, you might be going, God, this is so boring. I can't believe I'm listening to this. And you could be desiring all sorts of things. Um, and even your desires to not be listening to this or whatever it is you want to do, those desires might be conflicting, right? You might say, oh, man, this is boring I'd rather be going to the gym or I could be going or I could go watch a movie and even of the gym movie wow what should I do so the point is there's a lot of desires and part of happiness is figuring those out and making sense of them so he says that all desires fit into two main classes the natural and the groundless now the groundless ones, the, the drawback is he doesn't give us a whole lot of explanations um, and examples. So we got to kind of intuit this a little bit. Groundless would be, um, I guess we could say, what, random? Or else just, I'm going to say weird. So weird desires that don't go anything. Like suppose you wanted to be a cat, right, and that was your thing. And there are people like that, right? You could actually get surgeries to make yourself look like a cat. That's just, to him, absolutely groundless. There's no reason whatsoever for such a desire. In other words, it's unnatural. Natural desires are those that have at least some element of what's good for us. And of these, he says, there are those that are merely natural. Okay? And then there are some that are necessary. Now, 
merely natural, here, here might be an example. You take something like um, sugar. We have a desire as a species for sugar. And that's a natural desire. A, uh, but it's merely natural. It's not necessary. So the deal is, we could survive without sugar. And I'm talking like refined sugar. Obviously, we need glucose, yada, yada, yada. So if you're you know, heavy into biology, just understand this on a very simple level. Um, so you could say, well, you know, we have a natural desire for sugar. And obviously, in terms of, you know, evolution, that's a good thing. Because throughout most of our history, and indeed in most nations on the planet now, there isn't a lot of sugar and calories available. Um, we take for granted in America that we have so much, right, that here we are, in the, the most obese nation on the planet, because we have sugar available everywhere. So in other words, for us, sugar is not necessary, although it is natural, right? So it's not bad in itself. Um, but we don't need it necessarily. Now, the necessary desires, he says, some are necessary for happiness. Some are necessary for freedom from disturbance. And some are necessary for life. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking of an example here. Something like um, sexuality might be a good example. I mean, obviously, um, you know, think of the desires to procreate, right? They are important for life. Obviously, we wouldn't have a species here, right? We, none of us would be here were there not desire to procreate. So it's natural and it's necessary for life. But then also sometimes you could say, well, if, you know, it's bothering you, um, you might need to do what you need to do in order to be free from disturbance. And then there's another level at which you might say, well, yeah, but it's not just about I've got to do it to free me from disturbance, but perhaps it brings um, a higher level of happiness. I don't know if that works. I think it does. Now, freedom from disturbance. The Greek word for freedom from disturbance is ataraxia. And this means that you have no pain in your soul. Now, what does he mean by pain? Pain is not just ouch. Pain is also the noticeable absence of a pleasure that you want. Does that make sense? So it's like, like let's suppose you really like beer and you're jonesing for a beer, right? Like, gosh, I could so go for a beer. That would be considered uh, to Epicurus pain. That sense of, oh man, I could really go for this is to him a pain. So freedom from disturbance is all about removing the pains from our soul. So perhaps one way to do so would be to overcome the need, um, or as um, Oscar Wilde famously said, uh, something to the effect of, uh, um, yeah, I, I, something, something like this. He said something like, um, the way I deal with temptation is to give into it. You know, that kind of sense. So that's what ataraxia means. And ataraxia is really the goal of Epicureans. Because ataraxia is the next step towards happiness. So after our souls are no longer disturbed by the need for pleasures, then we're good to go. Um, and then he gives us a couple other, throughout the reading, a couple more things to consider. Um, he talks about self-sufficiency is important for happiness. And also of prudence, which is wisdom. But lastly, he says, on the very last page, ending the thing, practice these and the related concepts day and night. So in other words, you need to practice, practice, practice in order for the stuff to become a habit so that we can make our desires ultimately about freedom from disturbance and happiness, but it takes time and effort.